For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded signs, and Greeks looked for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who, whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise but by human standards. Uh, not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the the strong. Let me ask you this question. If you could choose between this nice, comfortable, uh, tempur mattress to sleep on or a bed of hard rocks with a sleeping bag, which one would you choose? Or maybe another question. If you had to wear a pair of shoes the rest of your life, would you choose your favorite pair of sneakers that you have or some good old Dutch wooden clogs? Which one would you choose? Or maybe one other thing would be if you had the chance to go on this nice, comfortable weekend to a spa where you were going to be pampered and, and you know, get that massage and, and all those wonderful things that come with it, or to go camping for a weekend in the middle of the desert at its hottest time of the year, which one would you choose? Now, I know you're thinking, okay, he's trying to, to set us up with something here, and, and the, the answer is, is yeah. And if I were to ask you, what is the common denominator, it might take you a little bit to think, but then ultimately you would probably be able to tell me uh, the common denominator between those three things was where you're going to choose comfort over something that was uncomfortable. Now, when you think about that, our society, especially here in America, places a very high value on comfort. And all you have to do is think about all the money that is made on products that they create for us to, to become comfortable. I mean, you can buy memory foam for your bed, or, you know, the lazy boy recliners keep getting bigger and softer and more comfortable for you to be able to sit in. There's body pillows now that you can have, or we've seen the commercials of the Snuggies to help you be a little bit more comfortable. And we're even getting to a point, even with our cars now, we have heated and cooling seats for the winter and for the summer. It's all about comfort. Now on top of that, there are TV shows that exploit our love for comfort. Uh, there was a show on for a while called Dirty Jobs. And, of course, uh, the, the, the pretense behind the show was that there are a lot of jobs out there that are pretty nasty to be working in. And, and it was the dirtiest of jobs that you could find. But what, did, what do we do when we watch that show? We're sitting in our comfortable lounge chairs, probably with something to drink. And as we're watching this show, we're thinking, oh, that's disgusting and awful. And we're thinking, you know what? I'm glad I don't have a job like that. We've uh, become pretty comfortable. Now, the thing of it is, is, is there's a danger um, in loving comfort way too much. And it's not just, well, you know, the more comfortable I am, ultimately the more pounds I'm going to gain, and, you know, that could be a dangerous thing. It's not necessarily that. Uh, the thing of it is, is this. The more and more we put emphasis on being comfortable, what happens is it follows suit in, every, in, in other areas of our life. 
So when we look for comfort, uh, whether it's being warm or, or, or cool or it's, it's the food we have or those kinds of things, it can very easily carry over to other areas. And one of those areas which it can very easily carry over to is, is our walk and our relationship with Jesus Christ. We can become very comfortable in our walk with him. I mean, we've even sort of done it in our churches a little bit. Um, some of you that are older maybe remember this, but, you know, what have we done? We, we, we come into a place in, in the cold of the winter like this now, and, and it's nice and, and warm and heated. In the summer, it used to be churches didn't have air conditioning, and while we need to make it a little bit more comfortable so, you know, we can grab hold of God's Word, so we added air conditioning, and we've got padding on our pews, and, and it just seems like... You know, we, we tend to just keep doing things to make us a little bit more comfortable. And then what has happened, and we're seeing this even more and more today, is as churches, we become so comfortable that now the message is even changing a little bit. How can we preach a, a doctrine or a message where all at once it becomes lifeless and, and sort of leathery, leather, leathery, and eventually the message the Messiah is sort of so washed out, it becomes what we call moral code mush. You know, we don't want to step on people's feet. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. We don't want to push people in their faith because we're afraid if we're going to do, to, do that, it's going to scare them off. And, and so we have basically as, as a church, and not necessarily our church, but the church worldwide, you know, especially in America, is, is we've allowed it to become comfortable. Oh, you can think how you want to think. You, you can, you know, we just are glad you're here. Jesus calls us to something different. In Luke 9, 23, and we've been looking at this verse over the last several weeks, Jesus says this again. He says, then he said to all of them, whoever wants to be one of my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to be one of my disciples, a follower and not a fan, must deny themselves. They must take up their cross and follow him. Fans like it comfortable. They don't like to be pushed. They, they don't like to have to make changes within their life. They don't really want to, to take up their cross as, as Jesus has calling, calling them to do that. I mean, you know, when you think about it, as Christians, it's pretty hard to avoid the cross. We, we see it all around us. And when we hear this phrase, take up the cross, the thought is, is what does that really mean? And for fans, as they want to make it comfortable, uh, it just simply means, and we use this phrase often, we all have crosses to bear. You know, it gets thrown around pretty loosely, and and we even get to the point where we use this crosses to bear mindset for menial and everyday tasks. You know, this past week it snowed. You know, and, and we're like, oh man, I had a great cross I had to bear this past week. I had to shovel my sidewalk. You know, and we take away from, from really what God is calling us to do. And, and, and we, we talk about bearing the cross, but we've made it at some point pretty comfortable. The cross gets pushed back into the messages that churches are preaching today. And maybe there's only that appearance at Easter when we're reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus made on that cross. And a lot of people, we see it in our society today, people are wearing crosses on their t-shirts and they have necklaces with crosses on them, but it has become very comfortable. There's, there's not a lot of significance, there's not a lot of meaning to it. And the thought is, is sometimes, and this is the battle we face, is what are we supposed to do with it? Because I think part of the battle we face is that the cross is a tough sell. And if we're ultimately going to deny ourselves and take up the cross like Jesus did, what's going to end up is that we're going to be dealing in conflict with the people around us. It's going to hurt our public relations with, with those that are around us. If we truly take up our cross, people aren't going to like it. 
It's going to hinder our ability to be able to recruit new people. And it's, it's not going to allow us to put our best foot forward. And, and so we see at times uh, really what it means to take up that cross as a burden or as a setback to ultimately what we think Christ wants us to do. But that's not the case. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the passage that we read today, at verse 18, I want you to hear this. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. I'm going to read it again. Listen to those words. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, for those individuals that were living in the first century, the, the, the time of, of Jesus, the cross was the ultimate symbol of weakness. You know, it, it, it's maybe a little bit more appealing to us today because we no longer see it as what they saw it. I mean, it was an instrument that was used for execution. And what we have done today is we've dressed it up. We, we see the cross as a wonderful symbol of, of, of what God has done and that, that relationship that we can have with Jesus Christ. But it, for them, it was torture. It, was, it meant death. It, it ultimately showed weakness. I mean, when they put a criminal on the cross, it was the lowest thing you could do to a human being. They usually would be tied or nailed to that cross. They would be naked, and they would be there in all of their humility, you know, on display for people to see. And no matter how strong someone might have been, eventually the cross was going to bring out their weakness. As they put pressure on their legs, and then on their arms, and then on their legs, and, and to a point where they became so exhausted, they became so weak, that ultimately they died. We have dressed that cross up. We use the cross on our Christmas tree ornaments, <coughs> decoration for a piece of jewelry. But when you think about it, if a Jew from the first century would walk into our church sanctuary today and they would see that cross, they would probably be pretty appalled. They would look at it and they would go, why? Are you putting the symbol of execution up in front of this building and you're worshiping and, and, and it's a symbol of, of what you're worshiping? It wouldn't make sense to them. It'd sort of be like us today saying, hey, check out my nice little necklace of a guillotine that I have that I'm hanging, you know, got around my neck. People would probably go, uh, you're pretty sick and demented. Or check out my earrings with the electric chairs on them. In the first century, they saw that cross as something that just was, was completely showing that sign of weakness. For us, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a point to say, this is what God was trying to do. And this is what God's trying to sort of point out. See, what God has done is he's taken the cross and he's made it this beautiful thing. God takes what from a human perspective would look foolish. A Jew coming in here uh, from first century that would see our cross up there, that's foolishness. Why in the world would you put that up there? But God has taken what the world would, would look at as something that's foolish, and he has made it something so beautiful. He chose what has no glory, what has no honor. He chose that symbol probably the least likely symbol that you could ever use, and he turned it into a symbol of love and life that says, this is who I am and what I'm about. God takes this symbol and he says, that's what I'm going to use. The world sees this as foolishness, as demeaning, as shameful, and what God does is he says, watch this, and he turns it into the power of salvation. Again, when we go back to 1 Corinthians 1.18 and you hear this verse again, it starts to really make sense. He turns the foolishness of the cross into the power of salvation. 
when you continue on uh, at verse 22, he it continues to explain that a little bit more. It says, The Jews demanded signs, and the Greeks looked for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. What I'm trying to get across to you is this. God has taken something that that seemed to be such a sign of weakness and, and he has brought about such a change in the image of the cross that it reveals a strength. I mean, who else but God could take that cross that represented defeat and turn it into a symbol of victory? Who else could, but God could take a cross that represented guilt and turn it into a symbol of grace? Who else but God could take a cross which represented condemnation and turn it into a symbol of freedom? Who else but God who could take a cross that represented pain and represented suffering and turn it into a symbol of healing and hope? Who else but God could take uh, the cross that represented death and can turn it into a symbol of life? Think about the significance of what God did with this idea of what the cross represented. There's no one else that could have done that. But God did. And what seems like the ultimate moment of God's weakness when Christ died on that cross was in reality the ultimate moment of God's strength. And here's why that matters. You might be thinking, well, why are we talking about this in terms of what God did with the cross. And the reason we're talking about that this morning is because this. This is the one point I have this morning. What God did for the cross, he can do for you. What God did for the cross, he can do for you. You see, when we are at our weakest, that's where we exactly need to be for God to be the strongest. And it's sort of upside down. You know, the truth of the cross is that when we are weak, we are strong. I mean, look at verse 27. It says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. You know, it's not that God used the cross in spite of its weakness. He chose the cross because of its weakness. And the the Apostle Paul says that God chooses those weak things. All throughout Scripture, we continually choose, he chooses the weak over the strong. And and the beauty of it is, is, as we see what God did for the cross, we can see what God does for us. And all you need to do is go back into the Scriptures, and you see that when individuals recognize their weakness, God took that weakness and he made them strong because ultimately God then was in control. When they were willing to lay down their cross, when they were uh, turning that over to God, God brought incredible strength. I mean, look at the individuals he used. Abraham was old. Jacob was insecure. Leah was very unattractive. Joseph was humiliated. Moses stuttered. Gideon was poor. Samson was proud. Rahab was immoral. David had an affair. Elijah was suicidal. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah was disobedient. Naomi was a widow. John the Baptist was eccentric, to say the least. Peter, one of his disciples, was impulsive, and he was hot-tempered. Martha worried a lot. The Samaritan woman had several failed marriages. Zacchaeus was incredibly unpopular. Thomas had doubts. Paul had poor health. And Timothy was timid. And you could go on and you can find individual after individual beyond even these that I have mentioned that in their weakness, God's strength was revealed. 
It seems backwards to us. Especially in our society today. It just seems backwards that God is saying, when you are weak, that's when you're strong. At some point it doesn't make sense because our world today is telling us differently. You can, you, you can go to a bookstore and, and you're going to be able to see you know, all these books that are written about how you need to help yourself. You need to be strong in yourself. I can do this. You can accomplish this. You know, you can determine your, your, your outcome and your fate and all these kinds of things. And yet none of them talk about in your weakness is when you can become strong. And it's hard for us because what it means is we need to humble ourselves before God. We need to get rid of the pride that holds us back from thinking that we can do it ourselves. And that's pretty hard for us sometimes to let go of. I mean, we all face it. I, I know I deal with it at times. It's, it's easy for me to say, I can handle this myself. God, I don't need you for this one. I'm okay. My, my pride says, I, I can accomplish this. And because of my pride, it holds me back from what God ultimately could do in that particular situation. You know, it's hard for me, and I think it's hard for all of us at times to say, we are weak, we just cannot do this. And, you know, because our mindset and our mentality is, is I want to be strong. And yet God is telling us, as he did for the cross and its weakness, if we are willing to just admit those weaknesses within in ourselves and turn them over to God, it's there that the strength will come. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul tells us more about that truth. He says this in verses 9 and 10. But he said to me, listen to these words, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the Christ power may rest on me. Paul is saying, if I have to just tell the world what my weaknesses are, I'm going to do it because I know that when I do that, God is going to use them in his way in which it will become such a, a strong and powerful message. In verse 10 it goes on and says, that's why for Christ's sake, listen to what Paul's saying. I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. And then this is what we need to grab hold of. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, I am strong. Paul says, I delight in my weaknesses. Now, I don't know anyone who naturally, naturally delights in their weaknesses. In fact, most of us go to great lengths to disguise and to hide those weaknesses that are a part of our lives. You know, if, if you had a job interview, and they're interviewing you, and you're asking all these questions, ultimately, you know, they're probably going to come to that dreaded question, and the dreaded question is, is what is your greatest weakness? Now, you're not going to really give a truthful answer to that, because you know if you do, they're probably not going to hire you. You know, you're not going to go, well, you know what, uh, I'm never on time. That's my weakness. Or, uh, I like to procrastinate. Or my weakness is, is I can't get along with anyone that I work with. You know, if we admit those weaknesses, we know what the outcome's probably going to be. So what do we do? We, we hide those weaknesses and we, we try to turn weaknesses into strength somehow in some way. We're, we're afraid to really admit what they are. So instead, we might say something like, you know, I can be a little bit of a perfectionist. Or, you know, I tend to be somewhat of a workaholic. You know, we, we try to make, make that weakness look like a strength. Now, why do we do that? We do it because the world is telling us that we, that's what we should be doing. You know, weakness isn't strength. The world is telling us strength is strength. But Paul is telling us something different. That strength comes when we realize our weakness. When my son was younger, you know, two, three, 
four years old. There would be a lot of times where we would be doing something, and he'd be like, Dad, I'm pretty strong. Watch this, Dad, I'm pretty strong. And he would do something, and I'd be like, yeah, Sam, you're, you're strong. Well, I remember an occasion where uh, we were traveling somewhere, going on, on a vacation, and of course, you know, when they're about that age, it's like, well, I need my own suitcase, you know, I can handle this, I'm strong, I, I can deal with this. So here he was, he had his little s- suitcase that he was hauling, he was carrying it along with him, and, and you know, I've got mine, and, and we're, we're walking, and we start to walk some di- distance. And pretty soon he stops, and it's sort of like, Sam, what's the problem? Dad, my, my suitcase is too heavy. I can't, I can't carry it anymore. Can you carry it for me? Sure. So I take his suitcase. And we continue to walk, and pretty soon he stops, and Sam, what's wrong? Dad, I'm too tired to walk anymore. You know? Can, can you carry me? And so as his father, what do I do? I, I, I gladly want to carry him. So I pick him up, and I'm carrying him, and I'm carrying his suitcase and, and all the weight that is there. But the thing with it is, is this. That's, that's the lesson we can learn about God. You know, uh, he was willing to admit his weakness. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm strong, and, and we don't want to admit it. And for us, in our relationship with God, we've got to be willing to admit that weakness that we have because we know that God is strong and he's going to take whatever weakness and he's going to become a part of that. What he has done for me, he did for the cross. And it's part of our pride that we don't want him to carry that load, that we don't want to admit our weakness. But the cross is a great illustration for us. It's a great example of that, like God did for the cross, in the weakness of the cross, he can do for us in our weakness. And that's really the difference between a fan and a follower. A fan is not going to want to admit those weaknesses. Jesus is part of their life, but they still have that mindset, I can still do it on my own. I can do it uh, the way I want to do it. And a follower recognizes that they cannot do it, and they're willing to just completely admit all the weaknesses they have in who they are as a human being and say, God, in my weakness, I need you to make me strong. I need you to make me strong. We need to trust God enough to let our weakness be his strength. You know, when we are able to let go of that comfort, our need to be in control, our need to glory in our own strengths and accomplishments, or in our paycheck, or in our trophies that we have set on our shelf, or um, a co-worker's approval, whatever keeps us from abandoning a comfortable version of the cross, it's then that God does in our lives what he did in Christ's death. It's then that God does in our hearts what he did for the cross. What he does is he takes our weaknesses as followers, not as fans, as followers. As when we're like hanging on a thread and he'll bolster our spirits. He takes followers who are at their weakest moment and he uses it for enormous kingdom good. He takes followers who are all but defeated. He takes those weaknesses and he turns them into their testimonies to life-giving messages of truth and hope. And ultimately, it's all to his glory. So here's the challenge that I lay out for you today. Are you willing to be the kind of follower that says, God, do for me what you did for the cross? as the cross was that symbol of weakness and that humiliation and and those kinds of things, God took that cross and he made it into something beautiful for every one of us. He took that weakness and he made it a strength. And the the challenge is, are we willing to lay down our crosses? Are we willing to reveal our weaknesses in such a way that God will use those to bring strength? 
that God will do that for us, that God will do that for this church, that God will do this for, for this city, for this nation, and for the world that is around us. God, what you did for the cross, do for us. And it might become uncomfortable. But you know what? That's okay. Because as, as uncomfortable it becomes, we know that God is going to use it for good. That we will find incredible strength that comes from God in that. Do for us, God, what you did for the cross. As we finish this time, I want you to think about fan and follower. Are you a fan or are you a follower? And, and my challenge is, is that God will place upon your heart this week to really think about that again. Am I still trying to do things how I want to do them? I, am I still trying to think I'm strong, I don't need anyone else, I don't need God? Or are we willing to just expose ourselves to the weaknesses that we have and say, God, I'm laying them before you. Use my weaknesses to reveal your strength. Uh, we're going to finish here, and um, there's a song that I think we're all familiar with. We're actually going to hear one version of it as we listen to it, and then we're going to sing another version when we're done uh, here to finish up our time. But it's when I survey the wondrous cross. And what I would like you to do for a little bit is just focus on that cross, uh, not in a comfortable manner, but the, the way in which God took something that was so nasty and made it into something so beautiful. And focus on it in a way to be reminded he can do that same thing with us. So listen to the words and...
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your scriptures tell us that if we want to be your disciples, we must deny, deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you daily. Lord, I pray that that will be our challenge today. That what you did for the cross, you can do for each of us. Allow us to get out of that comfort zone of our faith. To be challenged, to be pushed, to, to be willing to deny ourselves in such a way that you take our weaknesses and your strength is revealed in incredible ways. Lord, in this coming week, I pray that you stir us. I pray that you challenge us anytime we see that symbol of the cross. Thank you for what you did with the cross and what you can do with us. It's your name that we pray these things. Amen.